All right, who can hardly wait for the next chapter? All of a sudden, things are happening fast. So, uh, chapter four, A Not-So-Charming Evening. Thank you, Little Brown Books Publishing Company. Here we go. Uh, the twins left with Froggy and Red shortly after receiving the letter about the happily ever after assembly. The four of them rode in one carriage while all of Red's necessary luggage was carried in a separate carriage behind them. The twins felt sorry for the horses pulling the second carriage. It seemed like a very heavy load. They had half a dozen soldiers surrounding them as they traveled, which Froggy insisted was the perfect amount for safety, but not enough to cause, you know, unwanted attention. Wonder how many would cause unwanted attention. Halfway there, they came to a stop so Red could change into the enormous gown their scheme required. They pulled into a tiny field between two large oak trees and Red transformed the first carriage into a dressing room. She kicked Connor and Froggy out and made Alex stay inside just to help her dress. It was definitely a challenge as the gown was much bigger than the inside of the carriage. I would just like to point out that Queen Snow White never has to change on the side of a road, Red said, struggling to pull the heavy dress over her head. I suppose that's what I get for being an elected queen. It must be some consolation to know you were wanted, Alex said, trying to help Red move through the dress. They actually chose you to lead their kingdom. It wasn't just handed to you. Not really, Red said. After the crawl revolution, it was between me and the third little pig and didn't even want the job. He was a total recluse. He barely came out. Uh, he barely came out of that brick house that he was so darn proud of. And with one last effort, Red pushed herself up through the center of the gown. There we go, she said, very out of breath. The bo boys rejoined them inside the carriage, and the procession continued to the Charming Palace. There was physically no room for anything else inside the carriage with the four bodies and the mound of endless red fabric crammed inside. Did anybody else kind of wonder how they were all going to fit? Oh no, Red said after they had been on the move for less than five minutes. Did she forget something? What could it be? What is it? Connor asked with his face pressed against the window. Now I have to tinkle. <laughs> Everyone else in the carriage just groaned. The following evening, Queen Red's party arrived at the Charming Palace. The twins could not resist ogling all of the storybook estates and villages that they had passed on the way to the palace's front steps. Something seemed different about the Charming Kingdom, though the twins could not quite put their finger on it. Even beyond the lack of villagers parading through the streets and trading into the shops, there was a very mm, gloomy vibe that floated through the entire kingdom. The carriage rolled up to the bottom of the lengthy staircase leading up to the palace's entrance, and the twins were very relieved to finally be getting out of that compact carriage. They didn't care how crammed they would be under Red's dress. Anything would be better than the carriage. So they were greeted by a palace footman, and Froggy immediately jumped out of the carriage and busied himself with unloading the baggage in the second carriage. The twins both hopped out of the carriage and crouched on the ground. Red was next to hop out and landed directly in the middle of them. <laughs> Her gown exploded out of the carriage and into the middle of them. Um, but it securely covered the twins below her. Actually, it was perfect. Well, hello, Rowan. He's going to help us read. Do you like Landa stories? Of course he does. <laughs> Always an interruption, right? You never know what you're going to get from read aloud. All right, listen closely, Rowan. All right, so far, so good, Alex whispered under Red's dress. Nice bloomers, Red. Connor said, chuckling about the knee-length undersuits she had strategically put on. Red grunted and kneed Alex in the head. Ouch! That was me, Red, Alex said. Apologies, Red said, and then kneed Connor in the head. Ouch! Connor yelled. Froggy walked back to find Red and the twins perfectly, though, in position. 
are we ready for this? Froggy asked. I think so, Alex said. Roger, roger, Connor said. Oh, that is so reassuring, Frogger said, and used a handkerchief to wipe the beads of sweat on his forehead, because I most certainly am not. Take a chill pill, Frog, Connor said. No one's gonna know we're under here. Sounds like famous last words. What do you think? Hmm. Okay. What are the odds that they're going to pull this off without it, especially their grandmother knowing what they're doing? 50-50? Let's see. So the footman glanced over susp suspiciously from the second carriage. Positive. He had just heard voices come from bodies that were not visible. <laughs> Make sure you two stay as silent as possible under there, Froggy said, and then gulped so hard he croaked. Let's make our way into the palace, shall we? So Red took a step forward and the twins weren't ready. Red, we can't see anything. You're going to have to guide us, Connor whispered up. And how am I supposed to do that? She whispered back down. I don't know, narrate what you're doing, Alex said. <sighs> Remember, Red doesn't really want to be doing this anyway. But Red closed her eyes and took a deep breath, mentally preparing herself for the evening she was in for. Fine, I am walking towards the stairs, Red informed them, and they moved with her. She was walking too fast, though, for them to keep up. Take baby steps, Connor whispered. We're crouched here like chimpanzees. Red's nostrils flared. Sure, she said sharply. Now I'm walking sleepily up the stairs. The first few steps actually were a disaster. Froggy kept gasping every time he saw one of their sneakers peeking out from under the gown. Slowly, but surely, they managed to get the hang of it. The smoo they smoothly made their way up the enormous flight of steps. Now back at the carriage, the footman could have sworn he saw three pairs of feet under Red's dress out of the corner of his eye. But when he double-checked, they were gone. The footman continued unloading the second carriage, deciding he must just need glasses, or maybe he should just retire. Alex and Connor's backs were starting to ache from crawling up the steps like monkeys, but it only got worse when they reached the top of the stairs and the ground became flat, causing them to, remember they were walking like chimpanzees? Yes, slouch even more. All right, and now I'm walking towards the palace entrance, no more steps, Red said. A few of the charming, king, charming kingdom guards patrolling the entrance looked at her a little funny as she spoke. After all, she was walking at a snail's pace and talking to herself. Well, you certainly are, Froggy said to Red and then patted her back, trying to re reduce the awkwardness. Prince Charlie, welcome back, sir. The twins heard a very familiar voice say, Sir Lampton, Froggy clarified for them. Good to see you, although I wish the visit were for a different occasion. Alex and Connor tensed up, knowing Sir Lampton was just a few feet away. They held their breath, afraid he would hear. Now I'm walking inside the charming palace, Red said to the twins, but was caught by Sir Lampton. Uh... And I can't believe it. Feels like I was home just a minute ago. Such a quick trip. That was a decent cover. But from under the gown, the twins could feel the suspicious gaze Lampton was giving Red. Are you feeling all right, your majesty? Lampton asked her. You're walking so slowly. Are you ill? Alex and Connor exchanged a glance, wondering how Red was going to cover up this one. Oh, perfectly fine, Sir Lampton, she said. I just selected the wrong pair of shoes to travel in. My feet are killing me. Whew. Alex and Connor both sighed, and Connor gave Red a thank you pat on the knee. She quickly slapped his head <laughs> through the gown, and Connor bit his fist to silence a scream. Just an itch, Red said with another tight smile. How are things here? Froggy asked, trying to change the subject and distract Lampton. Well, terrible, he said. Have you not heard? 
I'm guessing not, Foggy said. What happened? So Lambton let out the most troubled sigh the twins had ever heard. Princess Hope was kidnapped last night. The twins gasped, unable to contain their shock, but it was covered up by the gas coming from Red and Froggy as well. What? Froggy said, devastated by the news about his only niece. What do you mean? Kidnapped and by whom? Rumpel Stilskin, Sir Lambton said. Looks like he's working for the Enchantress again, only this time he succeeded. Oh dear, it grew quiet. The whole world seemed to be falling apart for everyone. A few moments later, after traveling across the red carpeted interior of the Charming Palace's entrance hall, the twins knew they had arrived inside the ballroom, recognizing the golden dance floor beneath them. The room was filled with troubled voices and impatient footsteps milling about. Here, your majesty, please have a seat. The twins heard Sir Lampton say. Oh, thank you, Red said. I'm now going to slowly sit on the stool I've so graciously been provided with. The twins cringed from the inelegance of Red's statement. Thankfully, everyone else in the room was way too occupied to have even noticed Red and Froggy, Red and Froggy entering the room. She slowly sat on the stool placed behind her, giving the twins plenty of room to adjust themselves to her seated position. Sitting on the floor beside her, ha! Huh, it was a relief on their joints. Now the twins could hear small conversations from every corner of the room. They sure wished they could put faces to the voices that they heard. Connor nudged Alex and quietly gestured to a loose seam he'd found in Red's dress. He carefully pulled the seam apart even more and created a little small hole to peek out of. Anybody see where this could go wrong? <laughs> Alex did the same on her side of the dress, and they were finally able to see outside the gown. Okay, let's hope this works. So, although they need, oh, Rowan, what do you need? Hmm? <laughs> Close-ups. All right, let me see if I can get the book in a position where I can see without um, getting in Rowan's way. Here we go. Although they knew everyone in the room, there was so much heartache and hopelessness worn on all faces, the kings and queens were almost unrecognizable. It was really hard for the twins to see them all like this. Their lives had always been just perfect examples of happiness. But here they were, the most distraught group of people they'd ever seen. Queen Cinderella was seated on her throne, devastated beyond belief. Her hands covered her swollen eyes as tears kept rolling down her face. She was comforted by Queen Snow White and Queen Rapunzel, who used the tip of her remarkably long braid to dry off Cinderella's tears. Now the men paced around in the corner of the ballroom. King Chance never stopped moving, furious that his daughter had been taken from him. King Chandler and Rapunzel's husband stood near him, unable to do anything but watch. And Froggy, he joined them, lending his support with his presence. Last night I heard her crying, Cinderella told the woman at her throne. I got out of bed, went to her room. A few of the maids were on their way inside, but I insisted on checking on her myself. Yet when I opened the door, the first thing I saw were the curtains blowing. I thought that was strange, and I didn't remember leaving her window open. That's when I saw him, that poor little man, holding my daughter. Then heavy streams of tears flowed down the queen's face. Rapunzel rubbed her back, and Snow White held her tightly. Breathe, Cinderella. Breathe, Snow White told her. Cinderella caught her breath and continued. Then he looked me right in the eye and hopped out of the window. I screamed and ran to the windowsill, trying to see if I could see them below. But they were gone. That disgusting little man disappeared with my baby. Snow White held her, and she cried on her shoulder. This is all my fault, said a soft voice across the room. Queen Sleeping Beauty stood at the window in the back of the ballroom. 
listlessly staring at the land outside. I'm the one she wants. I'm the one she's after, Sleeping Beauty said in a bit of a daze. Why doesn't she just take me? Why does she have to make everybody else suffer so? No, this isn't your fault, Rapunzel said. You can't blame yourself for this, Snow White agreed. King Chance grew tired of pacing and groaned angrily. He needed somebody to blame. Where are those useless fairies, he demanded, and why haven't they done something about this yet? Ooh, a soft breeze blew through the ballroom and twinkling lights of every color of the rainbow floated through the room. The fairy council slowly appeared out of thin air. Uh, Emeralda was first to appear. We're doing everything in our power, she said. She was tall, black, and beautiful. She wore a long emerald gown that matched her eyes and jewelry. Emeralda always had a soft but authoritative presence. She was someone you could trust but never cross. Now Xanthus, he was next to arrive and was followed by Skyling. Ah, the blue fairy. Okay, Rowan is taking up a ton of room. Let's reposition a little bit here. She had pale skin, hair the color of the sky, and robes the color of the ocean. Tangerina appeared shortly after her. She was the orange fairy, and actual bees flew around her beehive. Violetta, the purple fairy, and oldest of the council, popped up close to where Red and the twins were sitting. Rosette, remember the short, plump, and rosy-cheeked red fairy, appeared next. Coral, the youngest, and the pink fairy, showed up shortly after that, hovering in the air thanks to her very tiny wings. So the fairy's colorful arrivals were a beautiful sight, but not beautiful enough to raise the spirits in the room. Well, it's just not enough, Chance yelled at them. The enchantress, she is one of you, is she not? You outnumber her, so why can't you handle her? We are greater than her in size, but not in strength, said Skylene in her dream-like voice. She's managed to grow more powerful than we ever imagined, Xantha said. I'm afraid even the fairy godmother is no match for her. <gasps> Speaking of the fairy godmother, has she or Mother Goose arrived yet? Esmeralda asked, looking around the ballroom. We need to begin. Well, another soft breeze blew through the room, this time carrying white, sparkling lights that circled in a bit of a vortex in the center of the room. And yes, a moment later, the twins' grandmother appeared with her crystal wand raised. The twins looked nervously at each other. Now that their grandmother was here, they were efficiently or officially in the same room as everyone they really should be avoiding. Forgive me for being late, the fairy godmother said and politely acknowledged everyone in the room with a comforting nod. There was a bit of an issue in the other world. Uh-oh, the twins had never heard their world referred to as anything else but home before. It was odd to hear it have a name of its own, although not entirely surprising. What else have the fairies been calling it this entire time? Well, Red Riding Hood, my word, that is quite a dress you are wearing, the fairy godmother said when she saw Red sitting in the oversized gown. Alex and Connor could hear each other's heartbeats and were terrified they were moments away from being discovered. Well, Red said nervously, thinking as quickly as possible, it is important to dress your best when the world is at its worst to raise morale. Well, yes, I suppose that is true, the fairy godmother said, though she didn't sound mm, fully convinced. With all due respect, I don't believe this is the proper time to be talking about dresses and the other world, King Ch Chance said. His frustration was building with every second spent without his daughter. Will Mother Goose be joining us? Uh, they asked, getting the meeting back on track. Well, the twins' godmother dropped the subject of Red's dress. No, she stayed behind in the other world. She said, 
My grandchildren are missing, so she agreed to continue searching for them while we have our discussion. <gasps> that is horrible, Red said, shaking her head a tad too much. I hope they're all right. I just love those two so much. Alex and Connor shared a very mutual eye roll. Does everyone else hear them? The fairy godmother asked, still eyeing Red a little bit strangely. Yes, everyone but the elves, ma'am, Sir Lampton informed her from the side of the room. We sent word of our meeting to the elf empire, but they have chosen to miss it, feeling mm, the current situation has nothing to do with them. Really? King Chandler sighed. So typical. The elves never get involved unless they must. Thank you, Sir Lampton, the fairy godmother said. Then let us begin. So King Chance stormed up to her. Tell us why the Enchantress can't be stopped. Why are all of you so incompetent, he shouted. The fairy godmother looked at him with her trademark compassion. Now, Chance, I am afraid I don't have your answers. Esmia is just as big a mystery to me as she is to all of you. Then tell us what you know, Chance ordered. Where did this monster come from, and what is she after now? Sleeping Beauty took a few steps towards the fairy godmother. I am willing to give myself up to her, if that is what she is after. Oh, my dear, you are not responsible for any of this, the fairy godmother said. I am afraid I am the one who is entirely to blame. Esmia wouldn't be here if it weren't for me. Really? All the fairies lowered their heads, knowing the fairy godmother was telling the truth. What do you mean, fairy godmother? Cinderella asked first. Surely someone like you couldn't be accountable for a creature like that. Fairy godmother closed her eyes and took a deep breath, deciding where to begin. There was so much to tell and not enough time to tell it. It all started centuries ago. On one of my first visits to the other world, the fairy godmother continued explaining. It was a horrible time for that world. There was plague and war everywhere you looked. Now today they referred to this period as the Dark Ages, and there couldn't be a better description. Sometimes the air would even be filled with so much fro smoke from all the destruction, the sun would be hidden for days at a time. Well, I discovered a little girl all alone in the middle of the forest, no more than five years old. She was crying and covered in ash and dirt. She told me her name was Esmia and that she had lived in a village nearby. Now, like many of the villages at the time, hers had been invaded by a group of barbaric soldiers sweeping through the village and killing everyone in their path, including her family. So the soldiers discovered Esmia hiding in a barn. However, when they tried harming her, the girl was able to defend herself using magic. She told me she had started a giant fire with just her hands and that it consumed her entire village and all the soldiers with it. The girl took me to her village so I could see the damage for myself. It was devastating. Not only had the villagers perished, but all the land around the town for acres was destroyed. I knew then that this girl was no ordinary child. Magic has always been a mysterious thing, but I'm absolutely astonished that a child in the middle of another dimension could have such capabilities. But for whatever reason, magic had found this girl and saved her life. And I believe my discovering her was by no accident. Well, I didn't think she would survive the other world on her own, so I brought her back to ours. I knew she was special because when we arrived in the fairy kingdom, the unicorns bowed. Connor looked at his sister. The unicorns had bowed to them when they first traveled to the fairy kingdom. So what did this mean? Esmia was raised there, the fairy godmother continued. We taught her how to use her magic and she became a fairy. Her powers grew with time and she proved herself to be one of the most gifted fairies the fairy kingdom had ever seen. Esmia was also the kindest, most honest, loving young woman. 
I had ever known. And she was so thankful I had brought her to live in our world and received so much joy from helping others. I loved her like a daughter, and she became my apprentice. And I was certain when my time came to an end, I could leave this world safely in her hands. I was also positive she would be the next fairy godmother. We created the Happily Ever After Assembly in hopes that Esmia would be the leader of it someday. But as Esmia grew into adulthood, she changed. Things were going on beyond our knowledge, things we couldn't see. And she became another person altogether. She became aggressive, mean-spirited, and her interest in fairy life faded completely. Helping people became a chore for her. She started to abuse her magic. Well, it was during our first official meeting as the Happily Ever After Assembly that I knew Esmia was no longer that little girl that I had saved from the other world. We hadn't officially appointed a leader of the assembly uh, yet, so I was still the one presiding. The trolls and goblins had just been sanctioned to their own territory, but they were still enslaving innocent people from other kingdoms. I asked the rest of the assembly what would be the best solution. And Esmia blurted out, why don't we just drown them all? Whoa. Uh, we can make it look like it was an accident. She almost seemed amused by her horrible idea. Naturally, after an outburst like that, we couldn't appoint her head of the assembly as planned. So we appointed Esmeralda and the fairy council instead. When Esmia found out she had been replaced, that enraged her. She went on a tirade, disassociating herself from the assembly and the fairy kingdom altogether. She changed her entire appearance and refused to be known as a fairy, deeming herself enchantress instead. So the next time we crossed paths with Esmia was at Sleeping Beauty's christening. She was uninvited, but we knew she would come anyway. We discovered Rumpelstiltskin had been working for her when he tried kidnapping Sleeping Beauty, and we confronted her about it. Oh, Esmia lost control and went on a rampage, cursing the princess to die after pricking her finger on the spindle of a spinning wheel. However, I knew that that curse wasn't only going to affect Sleeping Beauty. Esmia's powers were way too strong for that amount of rage to be aimed at just an innocent child. So luckily, I was able to convert the curse into a harmless sleeping spell, and when she pricked her finger on the spinning wheel as planned, the entire kingdom was affected, confirming my suspicion. Esmia disappeared after the christening, and we never saw her again. We searched everywhere, but found no traces. Later, word reached us that she had been poisoned by the same toxins that left the Upper Easter Kingdom bare. So we figured she must have died, and we stopped our search. Unfortunately, we were wrong. So a year ago, my grandchildren accidentally found a way into this world and went missing. While I was searching for them, I made a very troublesome discovery. Small weeds started to grow in the northeast where the flowers and grass had grown. The land had revived itself from the poison, except the poison had obliterated everything good that had come from the soil, and the weeds had now taken its place. I knew then it would only be a matter of time before Esmia resurfaced, so I altered the fairy council, or I alerted the fairy council at once, and we spent the last year actively searching for her but we had found nothing to lead us in the right direction. It was not until her recent attack on the Eastern Kingdom that we were positive she had returned. The crowd in the ballroom was ever so tense after hearing Esmia's story. And, and why can't we stop her now? King Chance demanded. If her spells could be converted back then, why can't we get a grip on them now? Well, that's what I'm trying to tell you, the fairy godmother said. We taught her everything she knows. We taught her to use magic, magic from the heart. We had trained her to channel it from a good source, and that's why every spell she ever cast could be altered. 
But when she poisoned anything good that was left in her soul, well, that was killed. Now, Esmea's powers come from a place of darkness and from anger, forces that we fairies do not stand a chance against. And believe me, Esmea has a lot of anger. Hmm. Well, Alex and Connor just couldn't believe what she was saying. Was their grandmother insinuating that the enchantress really was unstoppable? So what are we to do? Snow White asked. Fairy Godmother lowered her eyes and looked down at the floor, hating to say it as much as they hated hearing it. I just don't know. Oh dear, if the fairy godmother doesn't have a plan, who will? Is it time for Alex and Connor to jump in? Maybe they have an idea. And how does this involve their mother? Hmm. All right. Um, and with that, whatever hope had survived was obliterated from the kingdom. It was as if the fairy godmother had told them the world was over. But suddenly, just in time, all the windows burst open and a monstrous wind blew inside the ballroom, knocking Sleeping Beauty to the ground. There was a gigantic bolt of lightning that hit the floor so hard the entire place buckled and its blinding flash produced the Enchantress. She's in the ballroom. She was the most majestic person the twins had ever seen. Her hair and cape flowed through the ballroom, and although her mouth was still, her eyes smiled evilly through her long lashes. Hope I'm not late, Esmia said. I do love a good story, especially when the story is mine. Oh dear, Alex and Connor clutched onto each other under red stress. Everyone in the room, of course, was frozen in fear. Don't tell me you're having another party without inviting me, as Mia said, glaring at all the royals and the fairies around her. You would think you would have learned your lesson from the last time you forgot to include me. A little smirk appeared on her face. Cinderella was the only person that moved. She jumped out of her throne and ran straight toward the enchantress with fists raised. King Chandler and Froggy were quick to grab hold of her, but, of course, she lunged with such determination Rapunzel's husband had to join them in holding her back. You horrible, horrible witch, Cinderella screamed, struggling against her brother-in-law. Magic or no magic, I'll put you, pull you apart limb from limb if you have my daughter. Hmm, Esmia just laughed at her. What have you done with our daughter? You monster, Chance yelled now. Um, uh, Emerald and Skylina placed their hands on his shoulders to keep him from charging towards her as well. She is alive for now, as Mia said, and casually examined her nails. I hope there are no hard feelings. I will give her back to you once I'm done with her. Oh, maybe. What do you want with Princess Hope, Esmia? said the fairy godmother. Esmia squinted at the fairy godmother and walked in a circle around her, closely examining her former teacher. Why, if it isn't the big F.G. herself, you're just looking rather old. Grams, is there something on your mind? Is something troubling you? Don't be cheeky, Esmia. It's a shade you never wore well. The fairy godmother replied back. Esmia frowned at the playfulness. You're good at putting on the noble facade, but I know better. Have you told them what I took from you yet? Or have you left that part of the little story out because you were afraid they would worry more knowing you're just as terrified as the rest of them? The fairy godmother kept her silence, not giving in to Esmia's games. Fine, I'll tell them. As Mia said, and faced the rest of the room. I have her granddaughter. Everyone in the room gasped, including the twins. What was she talking about? Alex wondered. 
fairy godmother looked puzzled as well, wondering if the enchantress had managed to get hold of Alex as well as Charlotte. My, my granddaughter, the fairy godmother asked. Then Esme rolled her eyes. Oh, don't look so surprised. I took her weeks ago. You had to have known. I left you plenty of clues. The fairy godmother looked at Esme with the most neutral face she could muster. How'd you get to her? She asked. Ha! Huh, it was simple, as most things are for me, of course. Esmea said this with a very small shrug. I stole that book of yours, the old one with all our history in it. Ha! Huh, the portal. I cast a little tiny spell on it and was able to pluck her straight out of the other world. I said, bringing me the um, Bailey girl from the place where the fairy godmothers um, presides. Bailey family residence, and that was all I needed. Stupid woman. She didn't even pretend to be someone else. She told me exactly who she was right from the beginning. <gasps> Mother pretended to protect Alex. Hmm. Alex grabbed Connor's hand, and they locked eyes. She thinks Mom is me, Alex whispered to her brother. And Mom, Mom must be going along with it, back, Connor whispered back. But... But why was she taken instead of you? Alex clutched Connor's shoulders as the answer came to her. Connor, I was in my honors class when mom went missing. I was in the next town. I wasn't in the place where we reside. That's why she got mom instead. The fairy godmother began nodding her head, coming to the same conclusion as the twins. She looked over to Red and stared down at her huge gown again. The twins could have sworn she was looking straight at them. Did she know they were under there? Whatever she did or didn't know, it made the fairy godmother stand a little taller, knowing the enchantress had made a very grave mistake. I'll admit, you have our attention now, the fairy godmother said, quickly looking back to Esmia. So, what is it that you want from us? Why have you graced us with your presence tonight? Ha ha. A very menacing smile grew on the enchantress's face. This was the part she'd been waiting two whole centuries to tell them. As you may have guessed, I've decided to take over the world, Esmia said very matter-of-factly with a very small yawn. But rather than continuing to show you examples of my powerful wrath, I've decided to give you an opportunity that will make all of our lives easier. I want you all to renounce your thrones and hand over your kingdoms to me. Willingly. Well, this is never going to happen, is it? The entire room erupted in outrage. The men had to restrain Cinderella once again. Never! Chance shouted, speaking for everyone in the room. Even with an entire kingdom consumed, and a young princess's life at stake, there is still hesitation, as Mia said, shaking her head. I'm going to take over. It's unpreventable, and I'm giving you a chance to accept your defeat with dignity. You'd be wise to take my offer. Nobody moved or made a sound under Esmia's heavy glare. So she turned to Sleeping Beauty, who was still on the floor trembling under the Enchantress's gaze. Why don't you do it first, Sleeping Beauty, as Mia said. Come on now, show your fellow rulers how easy it is. Your kingdom has been through enough already, poor child. Wouldn't you agree? As Mia hmm, is taunting them, is she not? Well... If you hand me over your kingdom, I will release it from my enchanted plants. So, do we have a deal? All was quiet while Sleeping Beauty contemplated the impossible decision. Snow White and Rapunzel shook their heads, urging her, don't give in, don't give in. And finally, Sleeping Beauty stood up and slowly walked over to stand behind the fairy godmother. Any partnership I make will be made against you. Any partnership I make will be made against you, Sleeping Beauty said, and my people would expect nothing less. 
All the monarchs and fairies looked to one another, inspired by Sleeping Beauty's bravery. One by one, they walked across the ballroom and stood behind the fairy godmother, showing the enchantress where their loyalties would remain. Now, eh, whoops, Esmia was beside herself with rage after this comment. The twins were positive they could see small little flames flickering in her eyes. You are all making the greatest mistake of your reigns, she said. But do not worry. They'll be ending soon. The fairy godmother took a few confident steps towards Esmia. No one in this room may be able to stop you, Esmia, the fairy godmother said, and then glanced over in the twins' direction. But I have nothing but the highest confidence someone unrevealed will find a way. Ooh. Alex and Connor looked to each other. Her words were so carefully chosen. Was she talking about them? Esmia's anger turned to amusement and she let out a long laugh. I see, she said. Y'all think you're safe standing behind your precious fairy godmother? Well, in case you think her promising words alone can save you, allow me to clarify. I feel like things are going to get kind of ugly here. Let's see. Esmia reached an up in hand towards the fairy godmother and a gigantic bolt of lightning erupted. It hit the fairy godmother, and she disappeared. A turquoise jar appearing in the enchantress's hand, and a ghostly version of the fairy godmother appeared inside of it. What will the rest of you do now that I have your precious fairy godmother's soul? Ugh. Alex and Connor squirmed frantically around in Red's gown. Alex had to hold her brother back as he tried running towards the enchantress like Cinderella. She's got grandma, Connor whispered, begging his sister to let him go. She's got grandma. She can't know we're here, Connor, Alex whispered back. Consider this my final warning, as Mia declared to the crowd. My attack on your kingdom will continue until you surrender to me. Well, we'll see where you stand when all your people are begging you to make the suffering end. Your days of happily ever after, ha ha! are over and another gigantic bolt of lightning hit the palace and the enchantress disappeared taking the fairy godmother with her everyone in the room was as pale as snow white the twins froze inside red's gown with their hearts broken no one knew what to do all the kings the queens and the fairies searched for some sign of optimism in one another's eyes the first time in history the leaders of the fairy tale world were helpless or were they not the happiest title to the next chapter hmm. but we'll save that for tomorrow that was pretty good stuff right <laughs>